and welcome to this week's Movie Math, where everyone was convinced that David Zaslav was Hollywood's Ebenezer Scrooge. But it turns out he's Santa Claus? What? Let's be honest, he's both. But hey, even if you're 50% Santa Claus, that ain't bad. Because yes, Warner Brothers Discovery had all three of the top movies on Christmas Day. How did that happen besides them releasing three movies basically at once? Well, it's because, well, I think as we've been discussing, the new fractured marketplace made them feel they could do it. I think also it's because no other studio has any movies, uh, a combination of the dual strikes that we're coming off of. Uh, and then also because some studios had some Thanksgiving movies, but they never materialized. So Christmas was just wide open and Warner Brothers just like threw a bunch of movies on it. And the color purple in particular, and I'm so happy about this because it's a phenomenal film. In fact, three of my four top films of 2023 are Warner Brothers movies. Uh, again, I have to point it out every time because everybody so, was so mean to them, but this, this was all from the former executives who used to run Warner Brothers films. But the color purple exploded out of the gate, tying 2012's Les Mis for the biggest opening day for a musical on Christmas Day. And both of those are runner up to 2009 Sherlock Holmes for just the best single Christmas Day opening, you know, for a movie that had just opened on Christmas Day. You know, those are the best grosses ever. I'm sure some of Robert Downey Jr. is like, why didn't we make another Sherlock Holmes? Uh, and they're like, have you seen your recent box office? He's like, how about Oppenheimer? Maybe, maybe Oppenheimer could help Robert Downey Jr. make another Sherlock Holmes. All right, so Les Mis was, of course, a huge awards contender, but it only walked away with one major win, and that was for Anne Hathaway. But, you know, so far, the new color purple has been extremely light on nominations. It didn't even get a single Golden Globe nomination, which shocked many. So this, this opening, which is, again, fantastic, might be what this movie needs to get some much-needed awards momentum. But just because you have nominations doesn't mean you're going to get any wins because the 1985 film, which wasn't a musical, but, you know, Oprah and Steven Spielberg are both back producing this new film, that was nominated for 11 Academy Awards and it didn't win a single one. Considered a huge snub back then and still to this day. In fact, when people talk about the new color purple in the 1985 film, a huge part of the conversation is how the first film was, so, was done so dirty by the Academy. And since the Academy seems to be on a constant apology tour these days, this might be the latest thing they want to fix. And, you know, some people, you know, the color purple has not been very much a part of the awards conversation for the past few weeks, but all of a sudden, and this box office is going to help it even more, some people are even tipping it now as the front runner for best picture. Again, incredible movie. I'd be th I would be very happy with that win. Uh, but I think the Academy wanting to right the wrong of what happened with the 1985 film could be something that is helping this new color purple. I mean, it's, the award season is cutthroat. Take whatever help you can get. Uh, we'll get back to the color purple in a moment. We'll deep dive on the audience, etc. But back to Warner Brothers Discovery, because this is special. This is interesting. Uh, again, instead of releasing a single big crowd pleaser, they didn't have one because Aquaman 2 is only medium. Uh, but that's been Hollywood's tradition, holiday tradition, for the past few years. And it's been quite effective, but there wasn't one this year. So Warner Brothers Discovery decided to release three very different pictures to match today's, as I said, more fractured audience. There was something for everyone at the multiplex this year, uh, plus a couple other movies. If that you either already saw any of these, were waiting to see them, or got sold out, which was the case for many with the color purple selling out everywhere on Christmas Day, as it uh, as it very much deserved to do. But while this makes for a nice headline, you're really looking at about an 85 million opening weekend overall for three movies that, without advertising, cost Warner Brothers. 425 million to make. So not a great return on that investment. Their best bet is to go for the long game because thanks to the double strikes of 2023, there aren't only there are not only very few big movies now, there aren't any coming up. So the the next big movie is March 1st with Dune 2, which what do you know, is also for Warner Brothers Discovery. What? David Zaslav sat on all these movies, and now he's just dealing them out to everybody. And he's the only game in town. Uh, I think the only real competition is uh, Paramount's upcoming Mean Girls in mid-January, which might, you know, take a little bit of a bite out of Wonka. 
Uh, but at the very least, these three movies, I think, will be pretty much the only game in town in, through, like, January. And then, at that point, I think people either you went to see them or you didn't. So they'll go to digital, and then they'll eventually filter down to max. But that's like a full month where, you know, I think these three, these three movies could really, really play. And that's where they're probably going to make their money if, if they're going to keep going. All right, but let's dive in to exactly, to find out exactly what Hollywood uh, unwrapped for Christmas this year. So for the four-day weekend, at least Aquaman 2 can say it's number one, because wow, this ain't no silver tuna this time around. Uh, the first Aquaman also came out for Christmas back in 2018, pre-pandemic. Uh, the, pan the pandemic ain't doing this. Uh, it's a little bit, a little, but I think, you know, you're starting to see well, I, I wish. I wish these movies are so good, particularly Wonka and the Color Purple, that if this was pre-pandemic, I think they would be doing even better. But we're talking about Aquaman. So the first Aquaman opened with $67 million, and it did 100.7 for the long holiday weekend that year, which was five days. That was five days. You know, Hollywood is bemoaning Christmas and New Year's Day falling on a Monday because it only creates a four-day weekend, where if these things were a little bit more in the middle of the week, uh, it would be a lot, you know, there would be a lot more, uh, lot more movie going We'll see how things go this coming week. Uh, and just as the oceans span the globe, so does Aquaman's appeal. 71% uh, of the first movie's billion-dollar box office came from overseas. That's huge. And likewise, Aquaman 2 is looking at world, a worldwide debut of 120.1, much better than its domestic number. And with It's a Christmas Miracle, China came back into play for this movie because uh, uh, it's Aquaman 2 is the biggest opening of 2023 for a superhero movie in the Middle Kingdom. It did the best. And, you know, even, you know, usually some Hollywood blockbusters have done well uh, in China, but it's been tough ever since, you know, they, they kind of closed down and, and shut Hollywood out. And even though they started to let some movies in, they're just not registering like they used to. So this is nice for Hollywood that they can kind of still do it sometimes. Now, I'm not saying Aquaman 2 will swim to a billion dollars as well, but thanks to its strong global appeal, it won't drown. Also, Fast X, also, of course, starring Jason Momoa, did about, well, although for Universal, did about 80% of its box office overseas. That, the overseas market saved that film and that franchise. And this is why Warner Brothers Discovery wants to stay in business with Jason Momoa. Some of us might be scratching our heads, but you're only looking at the domestic numbers. So what's up next for him in the studio? Minecraft. That seems ridiculous, but it might make a ton of money overseas. Domestic, Aquaman 2 at least had broad appeal thanks to its diverse cast, one of the few areas where DC has managed to outshine Marvel. Uh, it did skew male, uh, which is to be expected for most comic book movies. This is interesting. You know, you would expect a comic book movie to skew male, uh, and also because the two major female characters from the first film were sidelined for the sequel. But it's worth noting that a successful movie, a truly successful film, is able to break down you know, stereotypical demographic barriers. So the first Aquaman did extremely well with women. Women loved that movie, and they were a huge driving force for its success. But they're missing here. And that's something that they should have thought of when they were putting together the sequel. Now, sure, Amber Heard became very problematic for the sequel for Aquaman 2, but that doesn't, and you know, maybe they didn't want to do Nicole Kidman, but a lot of us were like, where's Dolphin? I mean, they had other characters they could have brought in, and I think they should have noticed that a strong, you know, female character and, you know, maybe a love interest for Orm if you're stuck with the Amber Heard dilemma. But, you know, a little bit of romance in there, uh, you know, seemed to, to benefit that first film. So you really got to deep dive into your audience uh, when you're thinking about a sequel to see who showed up, you know, and think about why that was and, and how you can repeat that with the second film. The second film is so different from the first film. Obviously, it's going to be a tale of two box offices as well. So as for Aquaman 2's long-term prospects, it tied with Ferrari for the worst cinema score, uh, cinema scores of the weekend. I think that Aquaman 2 is at least a fun family film, even if it, it, it does have flaws, whereas I feel Ferrari is largely unwatchable. But who knows, you know, maybe for some people, Ferrari is a treat. Uh, but, you know, it doesn't surprise me that they have the lowest cinema scores. So while Aquaman 2 is number one this weekend, expected to drop the fastest of this very large group. Uh, with digital and especially Max, uh, maybe a real sp sweet spot for the movie. But by the time it gets to Max, will anyone even care anymore? As James Gunn hits the reboot button 
very softly. And speaking of a soft reboot, uh, there's rampant speculation fueled by James Gunn himself that Jason Momoa ain't leaving DC. He's just switch switching characters and will now be, now be Lobo. But as I pointed out in my review, and many of you agree, he's already playing Lobo. Uh, but I think like for now, let's just focus on Superman legacy and launching the Gunverse right. Because the Snyderverse unfortunately proved the Big Bang ain't the way to kickstart a cinematic universe where the whole, the whole, um, whole uh, universe or galaxy is there at once. That is not the way to go. Slow and steady is what won the day for the MCU, at least early on, uh, as it took a decade to get to Avengers Endgame. Uh, and now the MCU is having problems because it too has become bloated and unwieldy. So something, again, something to think about. The numbers are very important. This is a lot where you can, you know, see a path forward. I think, you know, as I've said many times, Hollywood is the perfect marriage of business and creative. But the point is they're supposed to be split down the middle. So you got to do both, I think, for things to really work. You got to look at the creative, but you also got to look at the business and how the two affect each other. All right, next up, Wonka. While this musical confection didn't hold up as well as fans would have hoped, it was looking real good going into Christmas weekend, but then it just didn't materialize in the same way. Uh, but that's just domestic. Worldwide, I mean overseas again, a little bit sweeter, with just a 33% drop there. Putting the movie at a whopping 254.9 million globally, that's a lot of chocolate, in just its second weekend. Oh, that's fantastic. That's delightful. That's delicious. That's already about what both Paddington movies did for their entire runs and proves that writer-director Paul King is also an international talent. Not including advertising, this means that Wonka has already made its money back thanks to that slim $125 million budget. And remember, it breaks down to studios taking home about half the theatrical box office, which is why I'm saying it just now broke even. So if Wonka could indeed play, I mean, I think it's kind of already in a good spot for a sequel, to be honest with you, but if Wonka can indeed play all the way through January, I think the odds become even stronger for a sequel. But if I were Warner Brothers Discovery, I would announce that sequel right around anywhere from now to maybe somewhere closer to New Year's. I would maybe feel that I was pretty good for Christmas and New Year's already, but right around New Year's, I would say we're making Wonka too. So anyone who was still on the bench about whether or not they should see Wonka in theaters, maybe I could get them to go. I, they'd be like, all oh, right, if you're making a sequel, I'll go see it. That's what, that's, that's the name of the game. Sometimes Hollywood doesn't even make the sequels that they announce because they don't work in, in getting people to go. But Wonka's already, I think, very healthy financially. So, you know, let's see if we can just push it a little further with the sequel announcement. Uh, and this will also mean, by the way, that Timothy Chalamet doubles down as a Warner Brothers Discovery star with both this and, uh, and Dune. What a combo, by the way. What a combo. Uh, I saw it. I saw Wonka again on Christmas Day. It was just an absolute delight. I saw it with a sold out theater. It was so fun. I mean, I also got the soundtrack finally. Uh, but I have to tell you, for some reason, the music plays better when you're watching it with the visuals. It's just the perfect package. As for the color purple, with just one day in theaters, it managed to edge out Universal's migration for third place. And that was in theaters for four days over the holiday weekend. So that's phenomenal. The Color Purple has phenomenal audience scores. Oh boy, I'm so excited for this movie. Uh, I really hope that this continues. And it already has a little diversity to its audience, which is encouraging. Because naturally, black moviegoers were going to power this film out of the gate, and power it they did. Uh, older moviegoers, by the way, also showed up for this film, and they have been largely abs absent from the multiplex ever since COVID. And because COVID is still lingering, they've been reluctant to this day to return. Yet older moviegoers were really responsible for powering prestige films. So they've been sorely missed. So to have them come back here is uh, also very encouraging. Going forward, The Color Purple's goal box office wise is for repeat viewing. Repeat viewing is incredibly important if you wanna get those box office numbers up there. Uh, I don't know, how often do you tend to see a movie you really like in theaters? I usually will go, I usually see a lot, if I really like a movie because I see it often as a reviewer, I'll see it twice in theaters, once for business and then once for pleasure. Uh, but some movies I've gone, maybe three, I think the most I've ever seen a movie in theaters was four times. But some people will go up to around 10 times. And that's how you get these big numbers. So you want repeat viewing and then also to expand the film's appeal. And a hot ticket does just that. 
Uh, is there an overseas market for the color purple? Like there is for fellow musical Wonka and like there was for uh, new comp. We're now comping it to Les Mis. Again, these domestic headlines help. Headlines heard across the globe. And so other countries are like, maybe we should, maybe, maybe we should check that movie out. Uh, and then awards noms will also be helpful. Now, while so far the color purple, pur color purple has come up almost empty, you still have the Oscars, SAG, and the BAFTA nominations to be announced. And so if the color purple can really rally there, that will help it as well. Then also, can Warner Brothers Discovery turn the color purple into a cultural event? It already sort of is because of the history of the book and the 1985 film. But can it turn it into a cultural event beyond you know, black audiences? Can it turn it into a global cultural event for everyone? Disney Marvel was able to do that with Black Panther, so that's the model. And uh, that film's global box office, by the way, was split down the middle. So let's see what the color purple can do. What do you think it can do? I'll be very curious to hear your thoughts down below. I mean, I think you guys will be coming from very different uh, perspectives, those of you who have not seen the movie, and those of you who've seen it like myself, who know how incredible it is. Now, five other movies opened over this holiday weekend. Ridiculous. I mean, the movie going public is fractured, but are they that fractured? I think this was a bit, a scooch too many. My great, I mean, although if you, if you have a, like an AMCA list or something, you're probably having a great time. Migration is the lowest opening ever for Illumination, like by far, whoo, but no surprise with hardly any advertising. And as I tweeted and speculated before, I was like, was Universal really going to do this? And they did. They released Trolls 3 on digital the very same weekend. What the heck, Universal? What the heck? Also, for everyone who complains about stunt voice casting and animation, it seems to be necessary, as there's no huge name in migration to draw interest. I mean, certainly a lot of talented individuals, but Chris Pratt says hi. Uh, but migration has strong audience scores, so it might lag out, but will more likely be, I think, strong for Universal on digital, and particularly later on down the line on Peacock, where you'll, you'll check out migration for no extra cost. Then there's struggling awards contenders, the Iron Claw and Ferrari. The Iron Claw did okay for the four day, while Ferrari only opened on Christmas day. But at least the Iron Claw has good audience scores. Also, the Iron Claw is a very depressing film, so I think its time is going to come now, after Christmas. Uh, Iron, I would have not even opened it for Christmas. Uh, I would have, you know, this Friday is still within award season, technically, it's still the 2023 calendar year. I think maybe Iron Claw opening this weekend would have been a better idea. But it could, you can still buy a ticket for it. The Iron Claw drew young men, naturally, and skewed a bit white, uh, while there are no exit demos available yet for Ferrari. The Iron Claw with that audience score, though, as I said, I hope can play all the way through January. But Ferrari, I think the race might be over before it even started. I think if you are interested in Ferrari and seeing it in theaters, you went this weekend. Uh, are there any Ferrari holdouts out there? I mean, once you hear how bad the movie is, I mean, you might you might like it, but you can, you know, maybe it'll, you can experiment at a cheaper price point. The Boys in the Boat pretty much matched anyone but you, but again, The Boys in the Boat was out for a single day, whereas Anyone But You was for the full four days. These two movies, like The Iron Claw, played mostly to white audiences, particularly The Boys in the Boat at 70%. Woo! Uh, the Boys in the Boat, though, has an A cinema score, while Anyone But You came in at a B plus. So there might be a theatrical future for The Boys in the Boat. People, you know, again, slow time until Dune 2 hits in, on March 1st, so maybe some people might want to check out The Boys in the Boat. I also think that will do extremely well on digital. But I think anyone but you will go to digital even faster. All right, as for the rest of the top 10, India's Solar was able to run with the rest of the Hollywood pack, which is fantastic. While for the three-day top 10, before three movies hit for Christmas Day, The Boy and the Heron, Hunger Games, Godzilla Minus One, and Poor Things were all able to squeeze into the top 10. Poor Things is now in 800 theaters, but that per theater average is getting low. It should be a little higher than this with just 800 theaters. But again, so again, as I said last weekend, it will maybe need not just nominations, but wins to spark a new wave of interest. Although due to the extremely adult subject matter, it might just have limited appeal and that's just the end of it. Uh, so we'll see how, how, how things, I think that Poor Things, you can't really get a good picture for its success, you know, if it was successful or not, until you see how it does on the award circuit. And I'm including wins in that discussion. All right, over on streaming for Thanksgiving week, yes, Nielsen changed their graphics and the chart is now much harder to read. I don't know why they did this. 
I don't like these, these new graphics, but this is what we've got. Anyway, at, and you can see we're looking at Thanksgiving. It's Christmas and we're looking at Thanksgiving. That's how slow Nielsen is. So anyway, but they're the only game in town. All right, so anyway, Adam Sandler, when it comes to these numbers. So anyway, Adam Sandler continues to be the king of Netflix, delivering yet again. Remember, he just delivered recently with his daughter. But this time it was, its, it was his animated comedy, Leo, which even beat out Netflix's own Squid Game reality show. That's incredible. The rest of this chart still has a lot of acquired shows on it, as we're still kind of slow with new content coming off the strikes. Although Suits has fallen off considerably at this point. It's almost out of the top 10, in fact. So it's the age of Suits is over. And The Crown is the only original show really able to hold on here. On the originals chart, season two of the Santa Claus is once again a solid hit for Disney Plus. So expect a season three renewal. They've already built the sets. Why not? While Loki is hanging on, thanks to the thanks to some people who decided to binge the show after it wrapped. And this is about like a week or so after it wrapped. So that's nice. That's nice for the show. And speaking of hanging on, Invincible is still in the top 10. That's nice, although it would seem that that show, I think, waited too long to come back, and it chose a really bad time to come back when it did. It's also, also, also just half a season. But it was too crowded. It's around the holidays. I mean, talk about something that should have come out, like, in January, when there's nothing. I mean, Invincible, you know, they could have had one season all at once instead of breaking it up into two parts, and, uh, you know, they would have had the space all to themselves. Uh, on the movies chart, you can see some superhero movies and Elemental holding on in a sea of holiday movies as this is when the season just started. Again, we're a month behind. Elf, Home Alone, and the 2018 version of The Grinch, that's fantastic, are still the big ones, but kudos to new Christmas movies, Genie for Peacock and Best Christmas Ever for Netflix for being able to make a dent in there. Now, I saw some speculation in the trades that because of all this, uh, this and they did some speculation, they did some interviewing, and they said the reason you don't see any new theatrical Christmas movies is because the industry feels that streaming now has that market cornered with mediocre. I mean, I mean, they're fine. Some of them I liked quite a bit, actually. I told you I thought Family Switch and Candy Cane Lane, which hasn't hit Nielsen yet, were, were good. I thought those were excellent, but they weren't, they weren't theatrical level. They're not the level of Elf, Home Alone, and The Grinch. So it's crazy for uh, theatrical to abandon the Christmas marketplace. Although not everyone's abandoning it as Amazon just recently announced that next year, Red One will in fact debut first in theaters with a legit, fully fledged theatrical release. Kind of like they did for Air. Remember that? Uh, that was, of course, eventually went to Prime Video, but it had a legitimate theatrical run. So can The Rock not just save Christmas, but Christmas movies? We'll see. But I, I think that's ridiculous to not make any more theatrical Christmas films. Uh, over on Netflix's charts for just last week, Leave the World Behind is number one again. I think it'll do even better post-Christmas. That's when I'm planning to watch it. But this is the Obamas. They produced this movie. This is their first real hit on Netflix. They've had some solids, but this is a hit. The latest Ardman film, though, not so much, as that is a pretty low number, even though it managed to come in in second place. With shows, My Life with the Walter Boys rose to number one after debuting in second place last week, and that show must be really cheap to make because it already got a season two renewal. They must feel this is their new kissing booth into all the boys I loved before. Um, and that makes sense. I can understand that renewal in that context. And The Crown dropped its final six episodes ever with only moderate fanfare. That show seems to have stayed a little too long at the party and got a little too close to current events. Then on iTunes, Oppenheimer is now available to rent for just six bucks and jump back to number one. But look at that. The top three movies are all around three hours, right? So the holidays are a great time to watch three-hour three hour movies at home. So I think that's funny. There's Trolls 3 at number six, really, you know, plucking the feathers out of migration. But mostly you've got holiday movies here. And look at Die Hard leading the pack. It is a Christmas movie. I don't care what anyone says. It doesn't just take place at Christmas. It's a Christmas party, office party. And there's Christmas in the dialogue. There's Christmas in the music. It's a Christmas movie. Uh, and by the way, the holiday, I'm seeing real momentum for the holiday, which is interesting because, of course, it's not a new or even recent movie, but everybody's rediscovering it. And you know, you know who's not here? Love Actually. So it makes me feel, Love Actually is kind of problematic if you look through it to, through today's lens. It's got a lot of things that today, you know, just don't, they, a little icky. So I think it's interesting that the holiday has swooped in and kind of taken its place. 
Uh, as for the, I, mean, I heard like I uh, read an article about Alamo Draft House, which does a lot of holiday party viewership. Uh, of course, Elf is their number one, but they said the holiday is doing really well for them. So I think that's I think that's really interesting. As for this coming week, Hollywood wants you to see the movies that are already in theaters because including Wonka from the weekend before Christmas, there are eight of them. Go see one of the eight movies. So are you going to circle back or rewatch any of these movies while they're still in theaters? Uh, are you going to break down and watch any of them even though you might not have? Uh, my recommendation would be Wonka, The Color Purple, and The Iron Claw. I think those are all worth seeing in theaters. Uh, the Boys in the Boat is excellent, and Aquaman 2 is fun, even though I think the third act is not good. But for those two, you can wait. And I haven't seen Migration yet. So the three that I would vouch for, for seeing, you know, worth the time and effort to see, and for some of you money, if you're not a subscription member to AMC or another theater company, Wonka, The Color Purple, and The Iron Claw. That's worth seeing. Those, are, those three are worth seeing in theaters. Uh, on digital, Anatomy of a Fallen Dream, because, you know, Movie Math is on a Tuesday this week because of the holiday, and it will be next week too. So Anatomy of a Fall and Dream Scenario are now already both available on digital. I haven't seen Anatomy of a Fall yet, but I did watch Dream Scenario, and I have to say it's not bad. It's, a, it's good for this, you know, between Christmas and New Year's space. Uh, while with series, all we've got is Netflix's Money Heist Berlin on Friday. That's it. Again, they want you to go watch one of those eight movies for the first time or again. So also, you can catch up on stuff you missed over the year, and be sure to check out my list of top 10 2023 streaming shows, link down below. So what have you been watching? What do you plan to watch? And what do you think of Warner Brothers Discovery releasing three movies for Christmas all at once? Genius, stupid, or maybe a little bit of both? All right, share those thoughts down below, subscribe today, and of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.